Skulls and crossbones, black flags, eye patches, sword fights, and hidden treasure. These are the things that one usually thinks of when the word pirate is mentioned. The highly romanticized depiction of pirates mostly stems from the golden age of piracy, a time of when maritime robbery contributed to a significant factor in the histories of the Caribbean, the United Kingdom, North America, and West Africa. With Australia being a country surrounded by water, and its history being a penal colony for the British Empire, the question arises, did Australia have pirates? Well, it's time to unfill that map and walk the plank. These are the top five Australian pirates. Welcome back to another episode of Shadow Matter. In today's episode, we're going to be exploring some of the most fascinating stories behind Australia's own brand of piracy. Pirates in the stereotypical sense of murderers, ship-stealing, treasure-obsessed outlaws are somewhat different in the land down under. Most Australian pirates were escaped convicts who stole a vessel to flee their penal punishments, many of whom were recaptured or considered lost at sea. While some others successfully escaped their punishment and reappeared elsewhere with a tale to tell. So without further ado, let's get into the top five Australian pirates. The first on our list is a Cornish convict and highwaywoman named Mary Bryant. Also, she was one of the first successful escapees from the newly established Australian penal colony. Mary Bryant was born Mary Broad in 1765 Cornwall, United Kingdom, to a farming family. In 1785, Mary was convicted of highway robbery by the mayor of Plymouth. She, along with several other women, were charged with having robbed and assaulted another woman on a road in Plymouth. The women were sentenced to hang on the 20th of March, 1786, which was then changed to a sentence of seven years transportation to the newly founded penal colony of New South Wales. In May 1787, Bryant was sent as a prisoner aboard the ship Charlotte. It was on this ship's journey she gave birth to a baby girl, who she also named Charlotte. While serving in the colony, she met and married a fellow convict, William Bryant. William had been in the penal colony for several years before he met Mary and his time served was due to expire in a few years. However, he might have ruined his chances at freedom by illegally selling fish and taking the money for himself. The couple had a son together in 1790 and lived in a hut at Port Jackson. It was in 1791 when the Bryants and several other convicts planned their escape from the penal colony. On the 28th of March 1791, William and Mary Bryant, along with their children and other convicts, stole the governor's boat, loaded it with new masts, sails, and provisions, and set sail under the cover of darkness. They set sail for Timor and spent a very hazardous 69 days at sea before they arrived at Kupang on the island of Timor, which at the time was a territory of the Dutch. The Bryants and their party of convicts posed as survivors of a shipwreck, but were quickly found out and handed over to the British. They were all sent back to Britain to stand trial. The journey back home saw Mary lose her husband and both children, as well as most of the escaped convicts. The trial saw Mary Bryant being advocated by a biographer and lawyer, James Boswell, which resulted in her being pardoned in 1793. Mary then returned to her family in Cornwall, where she was provided with £10 a year from Boswell until his death in 1795. She lived out the remaining days with her family. This Aussie pirate went by several aliases and was an habitual convict escapee and told some tall tales in his life. One involving samurai in Japan, which may have been recently found out to be true. William Swallow was born around 1790 and not much can be traced to his earlier life. But what we do know is that he was at one time an apprentice aboard a British cargo ship. He was later convicted of stealing sheep and sentenced to life of servitude in the penal colony of Van Diemen's Land, now known as Tasmania, in 1821, and was given a convict number of 323. Swallow was a true Houdini in that being able to escape his confines of penal colony life on several occasions, albeit being quickly recaptured. On one occasion, he made it all the way back to England by stowing aboard a ship to reunite with his wife. When he discovered that she had remarried, her new husband informed authorities that Swallow had escaped and he was sent back to the penal colony. Perhaps his most infamous escape was one that involved a mutiny, a journey across the Pacific, and engaging with samurai in Japan. 
In his own account, he states that he was on board a brig called Cyprus, whilst being operated on by a surgeon for various ailments. Whilst recuperating below deck, a mutiny on board took place. He and 18 other convicts then sailed across the Pacific. Their journey took them from Tahiti to Tonga and then to Japan, which at the time was operating under shogunate and enforced a non-foreigner trade situation with the outside world. With Swallow's account, he recalls that the Cyprus was in need of repair, fresh water and wood. They made it to the coast of Japan, where the ship was attacked by cannon fire. Eventually, Swallows and other members of the crew made it onto Japanese soil, where they handed a letter asking for repairs and supplies to the samurai guarding the coast for them to take back to their commanding officer. It was conveyed to shore, where the samurai in question were quickly and promptly reprimanded for disobeying orders of interacting with a foreigner. The samurai commander's response was, Don't accept anything from the barbarians. Take the letter back immediately. Swallow and the rest of the crew were turned away from Japan, where they set off for mainland China, after which they had set off for England. Amidst their journey back to Britain, word had reached authorities about the escapees and mutineers. They were promptly arrested and sent to trial in England. Most of the convicts were executed, but after testimony from the surgeon on board, the jury found Swallow not guilty of mutiny, and he was sent back to serve out the remainder of his sentence. He later died in 1832 of tuberculosis. For centuries, his extravagant story has been dismissed by historians, but recently this has been corroborated by Japanese historians upon which they have found accounts of the Cyprus entering the coast of Japan and records of the samurai engaging with the foreigners. The third on our list is not so much a person as it is an act of piracy that stands out in Australian history. The Ethel was a brig used to resupply pearl luggers in Western Australia and freight the harvest of pearls and shells back to port. In 1899, the multinational crew mutinied, killing the captain and several crew members. They sailed the Ethel to the island of Selaru in Indonesia, where it was abandoned. The mutineers tried to land their whale boats on shore, but quickly discovered that the natives were not friendly and were forced to row to the nearby Dutch trading station of Adoate. One of the crew who had been forced to go along with the mutineers approached a local school teacher and told him of the events aboard the Ethel. The mutineers, believing that they were free, gained transport to Madagascar, but the moment the ship berthed, they were arrested and returned to Perth, where they were tried, sentenced to death, and executed at Fremantle Jail. The reasons for the mutiny and acts of piracy on the Ethel are still unknown. Some believe there was a large amount of money on board, Others believe they took the ship to retrieve lost treasure. The most likely reason is that one mutineer had a disagreement with the captain, which ended with his murder and the guilty party responsible, coercing the crew to flee on his behalf. This colonial pirate's life is one of the most fascinating in Australia's maritime history, and his mysterious disappearance only adds to the infatuation of his depiction. James Porter's birth in England is suspected to be around 1805, but with a lack of resources, we can never truly know for sure. A convict record of his transportation to Van Diemen's Land in July 1823 gives us a little bit of insight. It states that he was charged with a life sentence for housebreaking. He arrived in Australia on the 19th of January 1824 with 150 other convicts aboard the ship Asia One. After serving 10 years, James Porter must have grown tired of the penal colony life, when in 1834, he and 10 other convicts decided to seize the brig Frederick after overpowering their skeleton crew of guards and set sail across the South Pacific. One story of the inspiration behind this act of piracy was that James had a family in Chile, a wife and a child. He left them to return to England, where he was subsequently convicted of theft and then transported to the penal colony in Tasmania. The convicts, along with Porter, sailed across the Pacific Ocean, arriving on the 25th of February near the mouth of the Bueno River in Chile. They scuttled the Frederick offshore, travelled the remaining length in a lifeboat, and passed themselves off to authorities in Valdivia as survivors of a shipwreck. The escapees managed to live in Chile undetected for a brief period of time before the governor of Valdivia was suspicious of the convicts' claims. Two years later, the British frigate HMS Blonde was passing by, and the governor alerted them to the British convicts. James and the remaining pirates were arrested and shipped back to England to stand trial. The convicts were put on trial in 1837 for piracy, which was punishable by death. However, in their trial, they escaped the full extent of the law based on a technicality. 
James Porter and another William Shires argued that as the Frederick had not yet been officially launched, it was impossible for them to have committed piracy, and because the ship was in harbour and not on the high seas, which is a prerequisite for piracy, therefore it was technically theft and not the latter. As a result, Porter and the remaining convicts were sent back to Van Diemen's Land for a 14-year sentence. He was moved to Norfolk Island in 1839, where he served on a boat crew in the service of the colony, and his sentence was reduced to seven years for good behaviour. Several years later, he was transferred to Sydney and then to Newcastle, where in 1847, he absconded and disappeared, never to be seen again. No one knows what happened to the remaining life of James Porter. All that survives of his person were the memoirs he wrote while in Hobart Jail in 1837. The top spot on our list goes to Australia's only real pirate in the stereotypical sense. Albeit his connection to Australia is admittedly a bit of a stretch, but nonetheless, his acts of piracy and terror upon the Australian coast land him as probably the best known pirate in the country's maritime history. But the legend he leaves behind is one that only writers of movie scripts and action adventure books could only dream of. Black Jack Anderson was originally from Massachusetts in the United States. Anderson was of African-American descent, and not much is known about his early life. He worked as a whaler aboard the American whaling vessel, the Vigilant, and in 1826, the vessel, along with Anderson and crew, arrived in Australia in the fledgling colony at King George Sound in Western Australia. While members of the Vigilant were drinking ashore, they got into a fight with another ship's crew. This resulted in the death of one of the other crew, and they placed the blame upon Black Jack. Although there was no proof that Anderson had committed this crime, he and the crew from the Vigilant fled the scene, stole a small vessel, and sailed to the Recherche Archipelago located near Esperance off the southern coast of Western Australia. With its uncharted 105 islands, this made for the perfect hideaway from authorities. At first, Black Jack and crew drifted among the isles, living off the seals and sea lions that inhabit the area, before finding a more permanent base on the biggest island in the archipelago, Middle Island. The soil conditions were perfect for growing crops, and the island also contained plenty of sustainable fresh drinking water. Once more, the island could also provide a shelter in the form of a large cave system, which is perfect for hiding loot and storage, but more on that later. For the next 10 years, Black Jack and his band of pirates ruled the islands, selling their seal furs back on shore, raiding passing ships and vessels, and terrorizing the coast. All of his victims who refused Black Jack's demands were promptly put to death by way of shotgun. In other instances, Jack and his team of bandits regularly assaulted the local Aboriginal tribes on the coast by killing the males and taking the females as hostages. A report of the situation of lawlessness in the archipelago made in 1842 paints us a better image of Captain Black Jack and the pirates that inhabited the area. It reads, One of the most daring of these people was a man of color of the name of Anderson, and lawless as these men were, they looked up to him with a sort of dread. Anderson usually carried a brace of pistols about him, knowing that he held his life by a very precarious tenure. By preserving exertions, he had amassed a considerable sum of money and usually kept one or two black women to attend on him and minister to his wants when not engaged with sealing. The sum of money that the report refers to was believed to be stored in the large limestone cave on Middle Island, with its chambers and deep tunnels. This made for the perfect hiding place for his wealth. Nothing official is known to what ended up of Black Jack. According to local legend, he was murdered by his crew, who had grown tired of his ruthless ways, and then buried on the island. Legend also has it that he left his treasure in the caves, still to be found to this day. So as you can see, Australia had a very different version of pirate and piracy in the early days of its nation's history. They were mostly convicts who wished to escape the penal colonies and return home, who committed acts of piracy or ship stealing as a means to an end. A few honourable mentions that I thought I would put in here go to the Madagascar, a ship carrying two tons of gold that disappeared on the high seas. Some think of this as an act of piracy, perhaps, or just another sunken ship. It remains one of Maritime's greatest mysteries. And the other honourable mention goes to Charlotte Badger, who escaped from Tasmania aboard a stolen colonial brig called the Venus, sailed to New Zealand, and was adopted by the local Maori people. She has also been noted as the first European woman to set foot on New Zealand soil. I've had an absolute blast researching and making this episode. 
all the fascinating stories that I've come across has been truly inspiring, and I hope you've enjoyed this as well. If you would like to see more videos like this, and you've enjoyed it, let me know in the comments. And if you did find this video enjoyable, then please give it a thumbs up, and don't forget to subscribe to see more content like this, and check that notifications bell to keep up to date with the latest videos. And together, we can explore the strange, the terrifying, the unknown, the shadow matter.